briefly, since uh, we didn't get to this at the previous lab session, this at least is one theory of how tartaric acid is formed from glucose. Now we saw the very schematic diagrammatic pathway in the la at the last hour on that one page outline. This brings in the stereochemistry, which incidentally, as I said, I don't expect you to remember, but it does give you an idea of how this goes through the gluconic acid phase. And finally, this split off to the four carbon, and then finally down to the dicarboxylic three carbon, uh, four carbon uh, tartaric acid. And this would be following, uh, you don't have a hand up? That would be this one here. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Bear in mind that when you're dealing with this chemistry of your carbohydrates, your carbon chain, the enzyme systems are, of course, tailored to handle different things. If you're going to get reactions, it either is going to alter in some way a carboxyl group, or you have this carbonyl group, the CHO on the end, or sometimes in certain compounds you have the double bond O within the chain. These are the active areas where you can get changes, and with the pro appropriate enzyme system, you can get breakup of chains or altering the end of it from a, a so-called sugar to a, uh, in this case now, to a, a uh, gluconic acid, a six carbon acid, CO, CO on H on one end, and then there's a break at this point, you see, the CO double bond O to form this, and then finally down to the tartaric acid. Now that's the theory how this is formed going from the glucose out to that tartaric acid. Uh, Dr. Cleaver mentioned right at the end, speaking of this, there is now data that's not published that indicates that maybe the, the uh, ascorbic acid is not an intermediary compound from the glucose through this on out to the tartaric acid. Now, this data, as I say, isn't even published yet. He mentioned it, and uh, so I will pass that information on to you that probably would be more proper to state showing a separate pathway from the glucose branching to the tartaric acid, not knowing all the intermediate compounds yet, and a separate one to the, <laughs> the other acid. <laughs> Ascorbic acid, thank you. Yes? Uh, that, that little two carbon fragments at the end is labeled an aldehyde or glycolic acid. Uh, mm -hmm. What is that? Does it do anything? It's, no, it's, it's a sort of a fragment that's thrown off in order to, to arrive basically at this thing here. It probably could recombine with any number of other things because you've got a certain amount of activity, you see, in this. Uh, carbonyl group out there on the end. With that double bond oxygen you see in the CO, H, why you certainly could get uh, recombinations there. Now the malic acid synthesis now, what we're really doing is showing the stereochemistry where at first, and the other slide I was just showing you lines. Starting here, unfortunately I got, no it didn't get cut off. That's actually all there is right there. Uh, your phospho enol pyruvate going through with ADP, adenine tri uh, diphosphate, in order to have your energy system, you see the phosphate bonds, to drive this thing, plus the CO2, and then to the oxalic acetate, now down to that. And this presumably is the pathway that where I just showed a line in that carbohydrate catabolism. Bearing in mind now the meaning of the word catabolism means breakdown anabolism, buildup, meta metabolism covering both processes. And finally, arriving then at the uh, malate. And also, there's another way where they can buy CO2, what they call dark fixation, uh, in the leaf, uh, also form the malic acid. As you remember, it could get in both ways, yes? Mm -hmm. Would it be safe to uh, substitute glucotic acid for ascorbic acid? Is that what you said? 
No, I'm not prepared to say that because this data being unpublished that uh, Dr. Cleaver just mentioned, we don't know the details in there yet. Now how he, these biochemists have a fraternity, you see, they get wind of these things ahead of time before it's actually published. No, I would say, to put it in a nutshell, you basically have tartaric acid that comes directly out of the glucose molecule, may or may not be through this other acid, ascorbic acid, but at least it is independent of getting into the Krebs cycle. In the case of the malic acid, it very definitely is well down into the Krebs cycle going one direction. Now, of course, you can get into the malic acid directly there from the peruvic acid. I think it's important to remember that you do have this link between glucose and the Krebs cycle through the pyruvic acid. I think that is important. Uh, you should know that because that pyruvic acid is becoming more and more of a landmark uh, as biochemists are delving deeper and deeper into this metabolism. Because as you saw in that drawing, it can go many different ways from pyruvic acid, depending on the enzyme systems that are present, whether oxygen is present, or whether it's an anaerobic system. Yes? So if you're doing a malolactic uh, fermentation, you have to go into the pyruvate intermediary? That's my understanding. Now there again, you start talking with Dr. Kunke, why he has tremendous lines of formulas. Whether there are exceptions, whether there are alternate systems, I wouldn't be qualified to comment on that. But at least the information I had here would certainly indicate that is the pathway, or at least a pathway. Whether there are others, I'm not sure. Are there any other questions then? So we think then of the Krebs cycle then as sort of the landmark pathway where we can expect to find in this chain of events your succinic acid, the malic acid of course, citric acid. In fact, it's often called the citric acid cycle. Now as far as the order in which those appear in that, I wouldn't expect you to know that, but I do think it's important. From the glucose molecule, you can get to the pyruvic acid by a variety of t two ways at least. One, anaerobically, absence of oxygen. And another way, you can, by the aerobic process, through a lot of, well, it's the pentose shunt, it's called. I wouldn't expect you to know that because it in itself involves a whole chain of intermediary compounds in order to arrive at the pyruvic acid. Now, once at the pyruvic acid, this landmark now, Here's where you can go many different directions. Into the Krebs cycle, actually two ways. You can go directly into oxalic citic acid or down to the uh, malic acid by that dark fixation of CO2. Yes? What determines uh, which way you're going to go? Partly equilibrium. See, so you have this merry-go-round that's going, depending on where your uses are and how they're siphoned off. See, if there's ammonia present, you can siphon off of this Krebs cycle three different locations in which it goes then into amino acids or protein. So part of it would be equilibrium, demand, supply. That's part of an answer, probably not all, the best I can do. Yes? Yes, your law of least amount, whatever you want to call it, uh, can certainly fit in. Uh, going back to that schematic drawing, can't find it. Someplace, it's here.
In fact, your question relates to the previous one. At any place, for example, if there's a, uh, a lack of something, this is going to block it so it can't go on. I might add that certain of these steps require energy, or rather release energy. Certain other steps do not because it's simply a rearrangement without the energy being released or stored up in the, in the glucose molecule. Now, to get back to your question, at any point here, if there's a jam up, of course, this stops it or inhibits it. Or if you have it siphoned off at this point, you have, of course, a decreased supply moving on to the next step. Now. Mm -hmm. There's a build up that will inhibit another step further behind, back up there, and it'll cause, uh, it'll cause a branch of the cycle that will produce amino acid. Uh, In other words, if this builds up, it's going to back things up all the way around here? If it builds up, it'll, it'll shut down one of the other systems up. Back up in here behind it. Shut down citric. I think it's a cynic shuts down citric, and then that leaves an excess of acceleracetate. And then that goes into acids. I wouldn't challenge the statement. I don't know. But it would be reasonable to at least theorize that this could be possible because it does have to go through this series to be in this so called respiration cycle. Could jam up in here someplace. Now we'll go back and finish up this other transparency then. Let's change the focus now to bring this part in, if you would, please, there. Right up there. See, we're on a parallax here, and it's not too good. That's about as good as we can get, thank you. Now, the amino acids, this is in the case of Cabernet, the study of the accumulation of the various, the important amino acids, at least the principal ones in the grape in this particular variety. Uh, August here, during August and into September, which you notice are the latter part of the growing season, you have this accumulation, very striking, of proline. And then to a lesser extent, threonine, arginine, and serine. And then there are many other amino acids that have been identified, but in a smaller quantities. Now, the proportions of these do differ from one variety to another, but proline rather consistently stands out as the dominant amino acid uh, among these various amino acids in the grape. Of course, in Cabernet, very conspicuously a large amount. Now, bear in mind, this is milligrams per 100 ml. So compared to soluble solids or organic acids, it's still pretty small. Are there any other are there any questions on that point? And this, of course, is made possible where the nitrogen, the ammonia, from root absorption can move in and probably tie on at one of those three positions in the Krebs cycle. Yes. Well, I was going to say anything that has nitrogen in it is protein, but I don't think that's quite right. Going back to that list that we have here, certainly enzymes are protein. These could not be classified as proteins per se, and certainly chlorophyll isn't, but it has nitrogen in it. And in order to, now the pathway, I should add, to chlorophyll is considerably different than the pathway, for example, to an amino acid uh, once you've passed this point of getting it in. It does take these combinations from these here with the ammonia to go this pathway to get here. Now, there is also a pathway, and I didn't want to get into this because it's beyond my depth, too. 
or my depth, I should say. I don't want to be presumptuous. You probably can go out farther than I can, some of you. But transamination, whereby the nitrogen can be incorporated into particularly the amino acids and the proteins. As I say, this is quite a simplification. Now, this is quite a nightmare. Photosynthesis formation of serine glycine alanine. Actually, what it is, it's a configuration illustrating another pathway for the formation of these amino acids. And I certainly am not going to expect you to know that configuration. And in the eight page handout that you have, there's more detail on this should you want to pursue that for enrichment. Now, are there any questions before we leave the subject of biochemistry now, as far as this course is concerned? It would be presumptuous to assume that I have answered all the questions. I realize that. Now, the next two transparencies pertain to let's take this one up first getting back now into marketing or into marketing which I wasn't able to touch on earlier First, we'll discuss the table grape profile here, and then I will give you an idea of where the wine juice grape deal fits in. These are all fresh grapes, of course. In order to supply the market as, with as near a constant volume as possible, from an economic standpoint, it's better if you can have a moderate supply all the time than severe peaks here and there. Well, unfortunately, grapes <coughs> are summer-oriented, but we do have a wide range in time of maturity among our varieties and we also have a wide range in climatic conditions that can further spread this harvest period. As a result, the perlet grape matures down in the Coachella Valley and they can actually harvest from the middle of May on through and even the middle or towards the last part of June. That would be the marketing period then for the perlet in the Coachella Valley. Now, in the same valley, the cardinal will start about 10 days to two weeks later, and then peaks. Then you may wonder why there's this small dip and then going up again. Well, this represents the volume that is produced in the San Joaquin Valley and also around Phoenix in the Salt River Valley of Arizona. There are practically no pellets in the San Joaquin Valley or in Arizona, the reason being that the cost of production of this variety is so high that it almost has to have the market all by itself very early in order to have enough return to pay cost of production. Now the Thompson Seedless comes in just shortly after the Cardinal starts in the Coachella Valley, rises very steeply, then there's a hesitation and then goes up very rapidly for the same reason we have one here. The production of the San Joaquin Valley and to some extent over in the Salt River Valley of Arizona comes in and of course this now is our major table grape variety rather con consistently from year to year in terms of volume. And of course at this point where it starts to be dotted I've arbitrarily put that in as the point at which they start to store the grapes. In other words up to this point your volume is increasing and now here you get this problem of old supply and demand coming in. Prices slump and it, when they reach the point where it's not economical to be shipping fresh, the men with good storages will store the fruit. So then the volume, even though the harvest has ended about in here, they will continue to move Thompson's for the next uh, two months, two months and a half out of storage. Now in the San Joaquin Valley, you have Rebeer, which is an important variety, builds up 
and it can store very well, so it will continue to be moved out past the holidays. The Toke variety used to be one of the big three. In other words, it was classified up with Emperor, Thompson Seedless, and Toke. And this is shriveled because, of course, the outlet is more and more towards wine and brandy. And as a result, the, it is shrunk. But the pattern of marketing is right in here. I might say another reason that it has shrunk is it's competing with the Emperor because, well, it's caught in the squeeze between the Thompson seedless, which is preferred because it's seedless, and the Emperor because it can store better and is a more dependable source for the supermarkets than the Toke, which is more subject to the disasters of the weather around Lodi. And then several miscellaneous varieties in here roughly about in this area from September, October. The Almeria and the Calmeria store quite well, so you do have them being marketed out to the holiday market. Now the whole area under this total curve, you can express it uh, in boxes and cars, what have you, it represents about 20 million lux a year. Approximately 20 million. 50 million what? 20 million lugs. The shipping container, something in the order of 24 pounds net of fruit. 24 times 20 million, put it in pounds. Yes? <coughs> no, the emperor is, you mean of our production? The emperor is, I would say, the most consistent as a reliable storage grape. The Rebeer probably would store almost as well as the Emperor, but there are problems with the stems of the Rebeer drying so severely. The berry inherently probably would store as well. The Almeria and Calmeria, of course, are the best white grapes for storage. But the problem with those, if you're stacking them up against the emperor, is that they will sometimes turn brown in storage. Now, an emperor also can turn brown, but the color is masked by the pigment in the skin. Now, that doesn't mean that even though it's hidden, it wouldn't have an undesirable flavor. Still, inherently, the emperor will outlast these two, in spite of the fact it has a, a shield there to hide the defect. The Italia stores safely for a month or six weeks. Now the problem with the Italia when it comes to storage, it doesn't develop that prized muscat flavor until it is very ripe. Here again, these uh, flavor compounds, esters and so forth, in most grapes develop mm -hmm. at the very high levels of soluble solids. Now unfortunately, as is true with other grapes, when they are very, very ripe, they are also more subject to browning from bruising. And the Italia's chief fault in this respect is its very, its susceptibility to browning during handling of pressure, lid press pressures, or rubbing, and so forth. So in order to gr get the flavor and have them very ripe, this, of course, also limits and shortens drastically the potential storage life. Generally, a grape that will bruise and brown easily is one that will not store very long in storage before it starts to turn brown. We know that the later you harvest Thompson seedless, for example, and store it, the shorter the safe storage season. In other words, if we would, say, pick Thompson's, say the earliest maturity that we could pick would be, say, August the 1st and we could still have fruit that was quite adequately sound by the end of August. I hope it bounced. If we put those in storage as we picked each lot from August 1st to the end of August, put them in storage, and then examine them months, two, three months later, we would have more browning in the grapes harvested the end of August than those harvested the first of August, even though there would be one month difference in storage. Because of the progressive ripening on the vine, these grapes 
the storage period is shortened to a greater extent than the amount of time that you have stored the grapes on the vine. And of course, men use this argument to, to pick earlier. And of course, from that standpoint, they have a good argument. But on the other hand, how much soluble solids are you sacrificing in order to pick earlier to have longer storage? It becomes a compromise. Now, are there any questions here on this distribution as far as table grapes are concerned? Now let us superimpose on here the curve for wine juice grapes. Now back in Prohibition, the volume of juice grapes shipped out of California was about equivalent, in fact greater, than this total curve here. In fact, I think in the late 20s, one year there were about 40,000 cars. That'd be almost twice this if we use the same scale of uh, juice grapes shipped out of California to those that wanted to make wine when they couldn't legally buy any. Then right after a repeal, of course, as you would expect, this volume drastically went down. But it went down fast for a few years and then tapered off. And there was quite an appreciable volume of juice grapes sold and has been sold every year since. During the war years, of course, there was an interruption. Now, it got down to about 4,000 cars in the late 50s, and then picked up again during the 60s. And part of that increase was due to the trade of shipping grapes into Canada. Now, for tax purposes, you can ship a grape across the Canadian border as a non-alcoholic product. But if you try and ship the wine from the grape, that's a different matter. And as a result, there has been a lot of juice grapes shipped over the border into Canada for home winemakers in that country. Now, to compound that, there has been, in the last uh, half century, a lot of Italian immigrants come into Canada. And of course, the Italians, with their great tradition of wine as a food, have been the chief buyers of these juice grapes in Montreal, Ottawa, and those various outlets. Now, if we were going to, and then, of course, our, call our Latin uh, nationalities in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and so forth, they contribute, of course, to this demand. Now, these grapes, as I mentioned earlier, are handled just like table grapes. They have to be picked, packed in a container, gas cooled, and shipped under refrigeration. Now, there's no incentive, particularly, to harvest these grapes before they reach full maturity. There is an incentive not to let them get over mature in the sense that they would then deteriorate and be harder to handle, more decay, and so forth. But they don't ordinarily harvest juice grapes until in September sometime, about all oh, the middle of September. Then it will build up very rapidly. I think it's up to about 8,000 cars now to a peak that would go up very sharply and then taper down very quickly within a period of about a month or six weeks. Now the chief varieties are Zinfandel, Carignan, Muscat. The varieties that relative to other wine varieties have a fairly tough skin. Not as tough, of course, as the table grapes. Because here again, you do want those carrying qualities. <clears throat> but the peak then would be somewhere from the middle of September till the end of October pretty much would be it for the juice deal. Yes? Yes. Alicante is another one that is commonly shipped. I'm glad you mentioned that. They like it because of, of course, the color that bleeds right out of it. They can see it right away. Even though we, of course, are aware of the instability of that color, uh, it still is a popular grape, yes, in the juice trade. Does any of these grapes being shipped Usually the juice concentrate because within this country it's far more economical to ship concentrate than it is to go to all the refrigeration and problems of uh, processing the grapes. Does that yeah. come from the same of the No, no, no. This has nothing to do. These cars are grapes shipped fresh under refrigeration. Concentrate would be, an, that would be a processed product entirely different. 
And there's a lot of it chipped, yes. A lot of concentrate. Because we can grow a ton of grapes here far more cheaply than they can in New York, for example. Where do they come from? The San Joaquin Valley, Fresno, uh, Visalia, Sanger, pretty much in that district. So they're not, they're not, the concentrates aren't made from particularly high quality. Oh, no, wait a minute. You're talking about concentrate? Yeah, I'm talking about concentrate. Oh, I thought you meant the black juice or the juice trade grape, not the fresh grapes. Concentrate. Well, I don't know enough about that area among the wineries to know. I do happen to know one winery down there that ships a lot. And that was, well, it used to be Aroma, Shenley, and now it's part of the Gill system, isn't it? Yeah. They have shipped a lot, I know. What is the volume again of these, of these wine grapes compared to the table uh, Well, at the present time, it would probably be about, uh, oh, about a third. It's all for people just making... Strictly for wine. Strictly for wine. Well... Yes, ultimately it is, most all of it. Now, the reason I hesitated, there are businesses being set up in uh, Canada, for example, where they even will take the fruit and freeze it, put it right in the containers, right in the deep freeze. And then, as a service to their customers, they can come around later and take these frozen grapes, thaw them, and very quickly run them through a destemmer right there in the plant, and then they the happy winemaker goes home with his slurry and goes ahead and puts it in his barrels and makes his wine. So they're building up quite a complex business around this thing, all to get it across the border before the alcohol forms. Did that answer your question? Yeah. But mostly for the home, home winemaker, yes. Is in Canada, like New York? Oh, yes. And likewise in New York. And uh, the Italian trade there is very great. And the Greeks. Do they have any wineries that, that get taken concentrate? Well, a lot of these concentrates from our industry go to wineries in the east for blending purposes. Oh, yes. What about the fresh grapes? No, not taking the fresh. Here's a winery in the east that needs vinifera to blend in with the American grapes, and this is very common. Yeah. To have them ship grapes and crush there would be prohibitive compared to ordering a specific variety, if necessary, or a concentrate, and shipping that. So it wouldn't be practical within our country where the tax factor wouldn't be involved. Now let's move to the last transparency and discuss for a few minutes the methods by which grapes are sold. If we think of our California industry and think of a distribution system as starting with the man that grows it, production, and of course the grower is always the producer, and ultimately the consumer, uh, it'll be consumed, uh, you might say, by different organizations in a sense. Of course, ultimately it's the person that consumes it one way or another. Now let's look at the intermediate steps. The grower, of course, in production, now the harvesting, it's the grower's own vineyard. He may very well harvest himself. Or he may sell the crop on the vine to a cash buyer. And this frequently happens. And from then on, it's the cash buyer's baby to handle it from there on. Now the grower doesn't sell a vineyard. He sells the fruit on the vine. Then the grower may also do the packing himself, and many of them do. Or the cash buyer who buys the fruit may pack his own, or it may be a co-op association, which is simply several growers that go together, form a co-op so they can pool their resources to maintain a packing shed, a crew, what have you. Or it could be some private individual that does this as a business. Then we get into the actual shipping operation. Again, it may be the grower ships his own fruit, and this happens frequently. And the cash buyer may do likewise after he's packed it. Or it may be put in the hands of a professional distributor who is just to his business to make contacts between sellers and large buyers of grapes. 
or the co-op association may do this, or again, a private concern. Now, transportation, of course, there are four modes of transportation. Rail, by refrigerated, mechanical refrigerated car now, very little of the old ICE car. There are the highway vans, refrigerated. Steamships, for about a half a million tons that we export uh, to uh, foreign countries. No, not tons, excuse me, half a million packages, I'm sorry. To uh, Latin countries, to the Orient, particularly Hong Kong, Manila, and then into Europe. Then, of course, air transportation is a very, very small one. There are, there are some grapes shipped very early in the season, back those uh, prolets, 10, 12, 14 dollars a box to hit those special markets. They will air freight them. And now there's an increasing volume of grapes being shipped by air to Asia, Hong Kong and Japan. Japan now is looming more and more in the picture as a market. With these big planes now, even in the late season, they can compete many times with surface transportation. Then we have uh, the selling operation itself. The grower or the cash buyer sells his own fruit, and by that it, it's selling it directly to a, either a job or distributor or a, a chain store. That's what their business is, a broker. These intermediate men that handle in large volumes. Now FOB auction or delivered auction. Now the FOB auction is essentially a thing of the past now. It's a system whereby as soon as the grapes are shipped, then the manifest or the inspection certificate on that load of grapes can be air mailed east or teletyped. And it's that piece of paper on which the buyers get together and bid and buy and sell, bid and, and buy. That's called FOB auction. Now the delivered auction, the auction part is the same. The buyers are together on a competitive basis. But in this case, the fruit is there physically. They've inspected it and make up their own minds from what they've seen of the fruit itself. And there are many of these delivered auctions still operating in the major cities in the east. They used to be the major place for routing fruit. But they've been shrinking mainly because the chain stores have been doing more direct buying from the producer himself. But the only difference between them is that the fruit's not there here. It's bought sight unseen, and here it's seen. But this is essentially extinct, passe. Now, consignment agencies are a very important method of selling grapes. They are agencies that are specific just for selling grapes on a commission basis. Uh, Blue Anchor is an example. Blue Goose. Nice to camp. These are operators that operate. And I might add that practically all of these steps in here apply to the wine juice grape grower, the same as for table grapes. The pathways of selling and distribution are essentially the same. Then uh, primary distribution. This sort of is now we're at the peak of the scale. The grapes have been funneled in now from hundreds of sources in California to the big constricting but large volume area, and now it's to be funneled back down into distribution to the trade. So from primary distribution, you have the jobber, the chain stores, delivered auctions, and then going on down to the fruit stands that buy from these men, the grocers, the peddlers, the chain store again, uh, hotels, restaurants. And finally, consumption, it would be the housewife, that takes the grapes home, the family that eats it, or if it's a grape juice processor who may have tamed it through here, the canning processor, or a winemaker. Yes? Well, it's actually a specialized type of wholesaler, really. We generally think of them as a super wholesaler. Many times, wholesalers will do business with a jobber. by FOB. Free on 
on board is technically the meaning. You're getting down into this. All right, let's take that up right now. Now, the methods of selling the grapes themselves, we've touched on it up in here. You sell directly to a cash buyer on consignment, that percentage basis, such as Blue Anchor. Now, in private sale, it means you're selling. The transfer of ownership is direct. Now, FOB shipping point, it means the price is based on the grapes at shipping point. Now, how does that differ from FOB destination? It means essentially the difference in price is the cost of transporting them from X to Y. If, for example, the price FOB shipping point price on these grapes is, say, $5 a box in Fresno, in New York, the FOB destination price would probably be a dollar and a half more than that, representing the cost of transportation. That's basically what it means. FOB pin down, pins down uh, location geographically in relation to where that produce is. Uh, yes? Your org, if you're buying FOB shipping point, does that mean that you have to arrange for the transportation, or does it mean that you just pay for it? Well, this would be in the contract between the buyer and the seller. The buyer in New York says, I will pay you $5 a box for those grapes in Fresno. The shipper says, fine, they're your grapes, man. You take them from there. So the man in New York has bought him FOB shipping point, and then he takes care of the carrier car charges and everything from there on. Or the shipper may decide to ship them on an FOB destination price. It's however they negotiate it. But usually always the difference, of course, is what it takes to get the grapes there. And it's around a dollar and a half a box at the present time, across uh, the entire distance. I mentioned the FOB auction is seldom used now. There's really not much point in mentioning it. Then the delivered auction, the one that was so major in our distribution picture up until a few years ago that it really set the price for two reasons, volume and the fact that the auctions in the east would open early in the morning. And of course, that means it's three hours earlier yet out here. So they very quickly, the prices going on when they're selling grapes at, say, 6 o'clock in the morning in New York would be teletyped all over the country and sort of like the stock market would be a barometer of prices in negotiating all over the country. But what is happening in the last, what has happened in the last 20 years is that the chain stores, the percentage of the grapes that chain stores buy has been increasing till now about the chain stores will retail about 80% of the grapes. Well, an organization like Safeway, with the number of stores they have, or A&P, or Kroger, for example, they're not about to pay all the additional service charges to let somebody else handle all those grapes in between when they can go right out here to Mr. Grower at Fresno and say, I'll buy that carload of Thompson's. I'll take that carload of Revere's because we have a lot of stores in the southeast where we can easily take care of them. So Mr. Safeway becomes the owner right there. So you eliminate a lot of this right in between. You go right to the carrier, you might say, and then the carrier goes right to some, probably not the supermarket itself, but a distribution center like in the south part of Sacramento that serves Safeway Distribution Center there that serves about 150 Safeway stores in Northern California and Western Nevada. And this has been the big change in this. It's really simplified the pattern in a way as far as middlemen are concerned. Now, are there any other questions uh, or any further questions on this, on this uh, grape economics phase of the course? If not, we'll have the lights, please. Now, just as a recheck again, how many in this section we expect to be here tomorrow afternoon for the discussion at 110. Just to check again, how many would be here? 
You can come and go as you please, three, four, five. So we're still all right on seating. There'd be no problem about that. Now, are there any further questions about any phase of the course other than grades on that midterm? And I wish you would come around so we can get that matter settled. Um, I imagine there'll be some part of this test will be on wine varieties, grape varieties. Uh, how, how will that be handled? Just well, there, there won't be any identification of varieties or leaves or fruit or anything like that, no. But I would look closely to the physical characteristics by which they're identified, uh, your rootstocks, the main ones that are used, and uh, such things as that. In my own case, of course, I will put the emphasis on what we've had since the midterm. But of course, I will cover the labs as well as the previous lectures. Are there any other questions? Well, I told the other group, and I can tell you just as frankly and honestly, it's been a good group to work with. In fact, it's been a real pleasure this year. We're here.